So we are going to have interactive session for breast cancer. Uh, I will be covering medical oncology aspect of it. And we'll have series of uh, physicians covering different aspect of breast cancer management. So the, as we all know that breast cancer is very common cancer. Uh, one in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. And estimated cases in 2020 were about 330,840 cases for the newly diagnosed cancer. So it is the most common cancer in women in the United States. Fortunately, early diagnosis of cancer leads to improvement in overall outcome of these women and therefore their lifespan have improved significantly with proper treatment and the number of women have survived and are living and with diagnosis of breast cancer and some of them are cured from malignancy. And uh, despite of such advances in management of breast cancer, it is still a second leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States. So early diagnosis is very, very important as we can change the outcome and also reduce the mortality. So the risk factors that we see uh, and that are outlined here, there is increasing incidence of breast cancer with the age. Of course, uh, it is you know diagnosed more in female than in male for obvious reasons. When there is a family history of breast cancer, especially first degree relatives and second degree relatives, then it is always a concern that is this part of hereditary uh, risk factor for the development of the breast cancer. Uh, personal history of breast cancer is always a risk by itself uh, for the contralateral, meaning the opposite side breast to develop a cancer. Therefore, this patient needs to be monitored very carefully. Certain pre-malignant conditions, meaning pre-cancerous conditions that are seen on biopsies of the breast are also uh, a risk factor such as atypical ductal hyperplasia or lobular carcinoma in situ, which is not a, although it says lobular carcinoma, it is not a cancer, but it's a pre-malignant condition, pre-cancerous condition. Prior chest radiation increases the risk for breast cancer. Sometimes these cancers are not garden variety breast cancer, uh, but it still is a form of malignancy. Patients currently, you rarely see a patient really receiving hormone replacement therapy. However, in past, when they were receiving hormone replacement therapy, the risk factor for breast cancer development increases significantly. Uh, African American population uh, have been noted to have higher mortality. It is unclear if it is just the disease and the nature is much more aggressive. Uh, or it is also that uh, they are not diagnosed early on. Uh, so is there maybe some degree of awareness or is there some degree of reaching to the medical community in a timely fashion is playing role, but at any rate, it is an observation. Uh, certain risk factors such as obesity, lack of exercise, uh, and uh, Patients who are in consuming alcohol, who are smoking, have higher risk of developing cancer. And also maybe there is increased risk for reoccurrence of the cancer in patients who are already diagnosed to have breast cancer. Well, recent use of hormonal contraceptives increases the risk. Uh, the risk certainly goes down as these are decreased. DES exposure is not a very common etiology anymore. Uh, it is difficult to monitor dense breast tissue, so it is not a real risk factor by itself. But if it is not properly examined and uh, imaged with mammogram complementary by sonography and maybe in case MRI if needed, then sometimes these diagnoses are not established early as these lesions can be obscured. Uh, patients who have not had children or children after age 30, 
our age of first menstrual period is very early and the menstrual duration is longer in case of menopause that is at a later age are considered as higher risk. Uh, breastfeeding reduces the risk uh, and uh, physical activity also reduces the risk. Although we say that uh, family history is very important and uh, uh, breast cancers are also noted in familial and in hereditary situation, that actually is smaller number of the cases that are diagnosed compared to population at large. So five to 10% of hereditary cause are genetic changes that are identified and inherited in these patients. And these are many genes, but BRCA1 and BRCA2 are the most common cause for hereditary cancer. But there are plenty of other uh, genetic mutations such as PALB2, CHAP2, ATM, which are also associated with uh, increasing risk for developing breast cancer. So it is important for these patients to uh, know their own family history and discuss with the physician regarding genetic testing and counseling. And actually, I would say that in many cases, not just BRCA1 and BRCA2 are done anymore. So we'll go a little bit about genetics of the breast cancer. As you can see in this slide, the general population there is 12% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer and median age of developing the breast cancer is about age 62. And about 65% of uh, patients who are BRCA1 positive have lifetime risk of developing breast cancer and uh, their median age is somewhat younger at 43. 45% uh, of the patients who have BRCA2 mutation are also at risk for developing breast cancer and their median age is generally 41. So, so patients who have triple negative breast cancer, whose cancer is diagnosed at a younger age, uh, are considered more aggressive, or at least uh, this patient's biological behavior of that breast cancer is sometimes less favorable, uh, and their outcome is therefore less uh, uh, desirable. So this patient needs to be money managed pretty aggressively uh, with early diagnosis and appropriate systemic therapy with chemotherapy and uh, also radiation therapy. Uh, so whenever there is a one or more first degree relative with breast cancer uh, diagnosed, especially younger than age 50, patients who have a strong, uh, who have at least one family member, first or second degree relative with ovarian cancer uh, and male breast cancer in the family, these are considered as very high risk for developing breast cancer. Other cancers that are also raises the bar to increase this patient's surveillance and also uh, consider genetic testing is patients with family members with pancreatic cancer as well as prostate cancer. Uh, so it is important not only just to know about the history of breast cancer, but to know the history about cancer of the ovary, pancreatic cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, and also patients who have family history of diffuse gastric cancer. There is certain type of mutations that are identified with gastric cancer uh, that runs in the family and they are at risk for breast cancer. And so therefore they also require evaluation with multi-gene panel rather than just BRCA1 and BRCA2, as I just outlined. And so also it should be remembered that ovarian cancer uh, alone is not considered as risk factor, but fallopian tube cancer or peritoneal carcinomatosis, these patients also behave the same way as ovarian cancer. And therefore, the genetic testing and counseling should be done for those patients also uh, with the family history. Now, we have seen that in Ashkenazi Jewish population, uh, the risk for these heredofamilial malignancies, especially breast cancer, is higher, and therefore it should also be considered as one of the risk factors to be evaluated uh, properly with genetics based on history and surveillance based on ethnic population. Uh, any male patient that is diagnosed with breast cancer at any age uh, is a concerning factor in 
uh, the family patient and should be tested for if patient is positive for BRCA, then the family should be tested. Um, and that is regardless of the age of the diagnosis of the male breast cancer in the family. As I mentioned earlier, that uh, there are other mutations besides BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, that are also considered as risk factor for developing breast cancer, such as PALB2, CHAP2, CDH1. CDH1 is the one where there is diffuse gastric cancer identified in the families, and these patients are at very high risk for developing breast cancer, especially lobular histology. Uh, P10, STK11, T50, T, P53 are other genetic mutations that are associated with higher risk of developing breast cancer. And once again, I have identified a few other uh, mutations that are in different alphabet supra that is right here, also suggesting that these patients are at higher risk for developing breast cancer and should be monitored as such. So once again, I mentioned that about 5 to 10% of cancer is hereditary, rest are sporadic, and therefore it is very important that uh, proper breast cancer surveillance is done for all patients. Uh, and I'm sure that Dr. Ferenc is going to address that uh, in our next session of uh, lecture. Uh, so breast cancer genetic, uh, in the, the the way it is inherited is autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive uh, inheritance. Uh, these are a little more technical terms. Uh, however, your genetic counselor or your physician can address this uh, for you. So each child, whether there is a male or a female, is at risk for developing, uh, inheriting the uh, gene, and therefore, whether it is a male or female child, it is important that these uh, family members are screened appropriately. If the patient is diagnosed to have genetic mutation, then all siblings and all children should be tested uh, regardless of the gender. And these altered genes are inherited from either parent uh, and therefore, uh, it should be the family history and uh, uh, genetic testing and implications thereof should be uh, clearly outlined for the patient so that the rest of the family members can be helped. And certainly, these genetic mutations are increasing the risk for developing breast cancer, but other cancers such as ovarian, pancreas, and prostate cancer should also be taken into consideration. So Dr. Ferenc will address the newly diagnosed breast cancer, how they are evaluated and managed in terms of surgery. And chemotherapy is depending upon the age of diagnosis, premenopausal versus postmenopausal, nodal status, size of the tumor, uh, estrogen receptor status, HER2 status. So there are multiple factors that play a role in order to determine who will receive uh, chemotherapy. And in some patients, we also do oncotype DX. Uh, so there is a whole host of consideration that needs to be taken into account prior to outlining treatment. All patients do not need, fortunately, chemotherapy, but there are patients who need chemotherapy should be evaluated properly so that early diagnosis and treatment can lead to long-term favorable outcome. So patients who survive and who have undergone chemotherapy and radiation therapy have also risk for developing other malignancies and also patients who are survivors are at risk for developing metastasis from the breast cancer. So therefore, they should be followed and monitored appropriately by the surgical, medical, and radiation oncologist. So we kind of have already discussed it that how much of the breast and ovarian cancer is a hereditary cancer. And as you can see that the uh, hereditary ovarian cancer or the breast cancer is a smaller portion of the pie compared to sporadic cancer. Uh, however, family history at that point, along with patient's age of diagnosis and the type of malignancy will help us think uh, how would we evaluate this patient and would we be consider, considering uh, a genetic testing in these patients. So indication of testing, as I mentioned earlier, early onset of breast cancer, 
any patient that has family history of ovarian or fallopian tube cancer uh, by itself would be qualified for further evaluation with genetic testing, especially if they are already diagnosed to have breast cancer. We generally would like to test the patient. Therefore, if the family member who has ovarian cancer or fallopian tube cancer is alive and well, then we would like to test them first and then do the testing on the patients. The pathology features of the breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer carries a higher risk and these patients who are diagnosed at a younger age uh, and have triple negative breast cancer, uh, we uh, do the genetic testing. Uh, the male breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer at any age, we, uh, we do the genetic testing as I discussed before. Uh, multiple pancreatic cancers uh, is an interesting situation where we certainly do genetic testing. Oftentimes, we are not able to find the genetic mutations, but some or other, these patients' family members have other uh, cancers also diagnosed, and therefore, uh, I would have to think that this is a evolving uh, field and we will ultimately find mutations where there are isolated family members with only pancreatic cancer malignancy and they really don't have other cancers in the family. So there has to be some other gene, although we are not aware of it at this time. Uh, however, it is certainly linked with breast cancer and prostate cancer. So these patients are in need for genetic testing. Uh, and so that if there is a known mutation in the family, then we know how to screen the rest of the family members. So normally we all carry BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. Uh, however, when these genes are not functioning properly and there's a mutation, it is then the cells can become ca uh, cancerous and then patients develop. So patients who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation uh, carriers have an 80% chance of developing breast cancer, which we had uh, seen in previous slides. Uh, all women with ovarian cancer should have genetic counseling and testing done, as we have discussed before. And 15% of the women with ovarian cancer can have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. 47% of the ovarian cancer patients with BRCA mutation have no family history. And that is why very first patient and you have to evaluate this patient with BRCA genes. 71% of the ovarian cancer patients with a BRCA gene mutation are 50 years and older. Therefore, age alone uh, is, even if it is an older age group that you have diagnosed ovarian cancer, you still have to do BRCA testing. The BRCA1 mutation, 55% chance of developing ovarian cancer, and 20 in BRCA2, about 25% of these patients have a chance of developing ovarian cancer. So even if you're a patient with breast cancer who has not been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, these patients we recommend that they undergo salping ovoforectomy, meaning remove bilateral uh, tubes and the ovaries in order to prevent uh, ovarian malignancy or fallopian tube malignancy because these are often not diagnosed early on compared to breast cancer. So the mutation probability for a male breast cancer is about 8%, although the number seems not very big. Uh, when you apply it to the population at large, you can really help many families and therefore it should be, uh, patients should be evaluated for uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation, and maybe even based on family history multigen panel. Breast cancer younger than 40 years, ovarian cancer at any age, breast and ovarian cancer in the family, uh, or the patients who have breast and ovarian cancer personally diagnosed, they have 86% chance that they are carrying this mutation and therefore testing the patient followed by testing the family members help prevent some of these malignancies or detect very early and thereby improve the outcome. Triple negative breast cancer at any age uh, has about 20 to 25% chance of carrying this mutation and therefore it is very important that triple negative breast cancer patient gets evaluated for genetic testing, especially BRCA mutations. So benefits of genetic testing is that it certainly ends the uncertainty that do I carry this gene or not? Am I carrying this gene or not? 
But even if you are not carrying that gene, that does not mean that routine evaluation that should be done by for any patient and the family member should stop. It only tells you that you are not carrying that gene. Therefore, further family members testing for the gene it can be stopped. And also certain procedures that we recommend, we would not be recommending, such as bilateral mastectomies and such as serving ovoforectomies and things like that. So it clarifies the risk of an individual patient that if you are carrying certain mutation, then what cancers you can potentially develop and how can we mitigate and reduce those risks. It also helps clarifying the risk of the relatives and also helps in decision-making process uh, regarding the management of the diagnosed malignancy or management, how you will do the surveillance to detect early these malignancies. It may also help managing, providing certain medications like tamoxifen to reduce the risk for developing a breast cancer. So in many ways, genetic testing helps the patient and the family and certainly to relieve some form of anxiety as well. As outlined that, you know, there are many risks that we have discussed, but there are limitations of any testing, and there is also risk for developing, risk of testing anybody for the genetics. Certainly, uh, you know, their insurability, uh, their concerns about genetic discrimination within the family, is the timing of the testing, is it optimal? At what age would you start screening and testing these patients and their families? Uh, would it change the family dynamics? And would it... Uh, there are some patients who really don't want to know the status, uh, maybe due to fear, maybe due to future cancer risk. And uh, by not knowing, they feel that maybe they will not have to worry about it for it. So these are uh, not a very wise decision in my mind, but there are some patients and family members who do not want to know uh, the risks, uh, the genetics and the want to undergo the testing. Negative test results may sometimes give false reassurance. As I mentioned, that if the test is negative, does not mean you should not be undergoing routine evaluation by your physicians for breast exam, mammogram, sonogram, MRI based on family history and risk factors, and uh, uh, other general evaluation by your gynecologist as well as by your gastroenterologist, meaning the surveillance that patients need should not stop because genetic testing was negative. So that false reassurance that negative genetic testing does not help the patient and family uh, if not explained properly. Uh, so I think this is probably a little bit repetition, but Dr. Uh, parents is going to go over the, the mammography and the indications and the when are you going to do it and how often. So the average risk of uh, breast cancer is about 10%. So the breast tissue awareness, the self-breast exam, the techniques of exam, uh, when would you do mammogram, how often would you do mammogram, in which cases you would do mammogram sooner, uh, when would you do MRI, uh, all of that Dr. Ferenc will be addressing. Uh, so as far as the chemo prevention is concerned, tamoxifen and raloxifen have been used in patients who have been identified to have higher risk of developing malignancy uh, and has been offered as chemotherapy uh, prophylactic uh, treatment for about five years. Self-breast exam is important. Exam by your physician is important. Exam by the uh, radiology imaging is important. All of these are complementary to each other and one does not replace the other. The risk reduction for the removal of the ovaries and the tubes we have already outlined. And the Dr. Ferenc will be addressing who will be undergoing risk reduction, mastectomy, et cetera. And I already discussed who would you give uh, three of, uh, who would you give tamoxifen or raloxifen to reduce the risk for developing breast cancer? My name is Veronica Ferenz. I'm a breast surgeon here at Montefiore St. Luke's and Crystal Run. Um, I'm going to be starting by talking about some of the screening recommendations. 
and explaining what is the reason for screening and what is the benefit. So we screen for breast cancer because breast cancers that are found by screening are more likely to be smaller, lower stage, confined to the breast. The size of the breast cancer and how far it is spread um, are important in outcomes with breast cancer treatment. Uh, the recommendations for the start of screening with mam mammography is age 40. Women should start annual screening mammograms. Um, and screening should continue indefinitely. If a person is expected to live for 10 years or longer, then screening should continue. If there are other factors that prevent the ability to do screening, mobility issues and other comorbidities that make it dangerous for this types of, these types of screening, um, then in those cases, you have to consider on a case-by-case -case basis whether someone really needs screening at that point. So women at average risk, again, should have annual screening mammography. Women at higher risk um, may be recommended to start screening earlier, and that's going to be based on family history, ages of family members that are diagnosed with breast cancer, or if there is a genetic mutation that was found. MRIs can also supplement uh, for high-risk screening in uh, women who have had prior chest radiation as children or teens. Um, relatives that have known genetic mutation or a known genetic mutation in an individual. Uh, if the lifetime risk is calculated to be 20% or more, MRIs should be incorporated as part of screening. Uh, during mammograms, uh, an image is ta taken by x-ray of the breast tissue. The breast density it is a description of how the breast appears under x-ray. And in the top picture, you can see the different categories of density that can be seen in women. And this varies, some of this is, is genetic. There's not really uh, any external factors that affect the breast density. Um, there's not anything that you can change in your diet or anything like that that can change your breast density, but you can see uh, in composition A, that's uh, a fattier appearing breast tissue. The background is a little more gray compared to the other types of density. Um, so abnormalities, which can appear white in, in, in the mammogram imaging, are easily spotted with this type of breast density. Composition B is scattered fibroglandular densities. Um, you can see that there's a little bit more white appearance in the background of these breast tissue and density. Um, however, we can still uh, identify abnormalities fairly regularly in this breast density. In composition C, which is the heterogeneously dense breast, uh, and you can see that is the bottom left-hand mammogram picture in this slide. Um, with women who have uh, heterogeneously dense or extremely dense, which is uh, the last composition D, these, because the background appearance is, has a brighter appearance, it has a higher chance of hiding abnormalities. So in these uh, types of densities, we consider using ultrasound as a complement to the mammogram screening. So ultrasound, when it's used for breast density, um, we evaluate the entire breast and the lymph nodes under the arm with ultrasound at the time that you get your mammogram. On the bottom pictures, you'll see a woman who is getting receiving a, a breast ultrasound and the image on the right shows a picture of a benign appearing cyst in breast tissue on ultrasound. With breast MRI and you can see the machine and the positioning that we use in the upper left hand corner of this slide. Um, breast MRI looks at the breast tissue in a bit of a different way while mammogram looks at the x-ray of the breast tissue an MRI uses magnetic resonance imaging, and it watches as contrast is injected. Contrast comes into the breast and washes out of the breast. Areas that contain cancer 
take the contrast up in a certain way and have a certain appearance on MRI. So we're looking at the breast tissue more like a video, whereas the mammogram is more like a picture. So this type of screening is used if your risk score, lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is greater than 20%. Um, and the way we use this for high-risk screening is we alternate the MRI with mammography so that you're, the individual with a high risk is getting screening tests every six months. So mammogram, six months later, a breast MRI would be performed as part of screening. Sometimes breast MRI is used for uh, findings that we need to evaluate further or symptoms that we need to evaluate further. Um, and in those situations, MRI can be very useful as well. After you uh, are have completed your screening, you will receive a letter. Sometimes these letters can um, have wording that can be scary. And sometimes the letters are pretty generic. Uh, but the imaging screening is rated on a scale. To the left-hand side of the scale, there's no findings or findings that have benign features, things like cysts or fibrocystic breasts. Uh, those would be categorized as normal, which is BIRADS-1, or benign appearing, which is BIRADS-2. In the middle of the scale uh, is BIRADS-3. Those are findings that have benign features, but they're either new from prior or have something that we need to keep an eye on. It's, it's not allowing us to evaluate the tissue in the area as well. So in those cases, we would recommend a six-month follow-up imaging to reevaluate the area. And these are the BIRADS-3 uh, findings on screening. In the right-hand side of that scale are findings that have some type of suspicious feature. Either they're indeterminate, we're not sure there may be a suspicious feature, in which case we would recommend a biopsy to confirm our suspicion or, um, or to clarify the finding further, or there are findings that are highly suspicious. Uh, so that's BIRADS 4 and BIRADS 5. Those are the findings in which we would recommend needle biopsy for further evaluation. Um, and the last category is a BIRADS 6. This is someone who has a known cancer and we're following something about this cancer uh, or monitoring this cancer. Um, there are additional ways that we screen for breast cancer. So it's not only with screening imaging, although that is the way that we can detect earliest stage cancers, we also look for breast changes. So on self breast exam or on clinical breast exam by one of your physicians, um, things like masses or lumps in the breast are evaluated for. If there's a change in the appearance of the nipple or the appearance of the skin, pulling in of the skin or the nipple, uh, discharge from the nipple, although in most cases are benign reasons for that. If it's a new symptom, that should be evaluated thoroughly. If there's changes in the skin, such as a rash or redness that's not responding to typical antibiotic or antifungal treatment, that needs may need to be further evaluated. Um, and any skin changes that are seen should be evaluated. So if there is a suspicious lump on exam, self-breast exam, a physician's exam, or an abnormality found in imaging, what are the next steps? Oftentimes when there's an abnormality found, found, found the first step will be to obtain additional diagnostic imaging. That will help us further characterize the findings that we're looking at and plan for further evaluation and treatment. If there are, is suspicious findings that are confirmed on additional diagnostic imaging, then oftentimes a biopsy would be recommended. A biopsy is how we sample a suspicious finding. Um, core needle biopsy is the preferred method of biopsy. Um, that way we can identify an abnormality on imaging and sample it under the imaging guidance so that we know that we're getting an accurate location, an accurate sample of what we're seeing. That can also help us to guide us with treatments if there is a cancer that's found on biopsy. 
when an, when an imaging finding is a BIRADS 4 finding where they're recommending a biopsy, 85% of the time, the findings from the biopsy are benign. But it's those 15% that come back as cancers that we want to find, and that's the reason for the biopsy. The types of biopsies that can be performed include fine needle aspiration. This is often performed if there is looks appears to be a liquid component to a mass. Um, they can aspirate the, the liquid and evaluate it if needed. Core needle biopsy is the best way to biopsy something that appears solid or appears suspicious because that's the we'll get more tissue with the core needle biopsy and we're better able to make a diagnosis. This can be guided by ultrasound. Uh, a core needle that's done under mammogram guidance is called the stereotactic biopsy. And that's when mammogram is needed to to localize the area of abnormality that was seen on screening. MRI guided biopsies are sometimes needed if we're not able to see an abnormality under mammogram or ultrasound, we can use the MRI to guide a biopsy. And the if we're unable to get a needle biopsy by ultrasound guidance, mammogram guidance, or MRI guidance, or even in the office under palpation guidance, then um, the last resort is a surgical excisional biopsy. Um, so you can be taken to the operating room where we identify the, the location and, and remove that area for further evaluation. What is breast cancer? Breast cancer is an abnormal growth of cells in the breast. Uh, these cells, when, when they're growing abnormally, can invade and damage normal breast tissue. And cancer can arise in any part of the breast. So it can arise from the ductal cells. Those are the cells that create the ducts that carry the milk. The lobular cells are uh, the cells that are part of the glandular portion of the breast, and they create milk when a woman is breastfeeding. So breast cancer is an abnormal overgrowth of cells, and the cells begin looking abnormal as well. Uh, the general category, there are many different types and subtypes of breast cancer, but the two main categories that we look at are invasive versus non-invasive breast cancers. And the biggest difference between those two categories is that non-invasive breast cancers stay within the breast. They have not broken through the walls of the, of the cells of the ducts, and they don't spread to other parts of the body. Whereas invasive breast cancers, because they have broken through the walls of the ducts, they can spread to the lymph nodes under the arm and potentially to other parts of the body. Uh, so in this de cartoon depiction, you'll see a normal duct at the top. Uh, as you go down, the ducts becomes overgrown first, then overgrown with atypical appearing cells. Uh, that's known as a typical ductal hyperplasia. If it gets to a certain point or a certain size, a certain cell number, it's uh, considered a ductal carcinoma in situ, which is the non-invasive type of cancer. It's a cancer that's within the duct itself. It has not broken through the wall of the duct. And the last two depict cancers that have invaded through the basement membrane, through the ducts, um, and those are the types that can spread to the lymph nodes. Stages of breast cancer are determined um, based on tumor size, whether or not the lymph nodes are involved, whether or not cancer has spread to other parts of the body. And stage is also partly defined by the biology of the cancer. So is it sensitive to estrogen and progesterone? Does it over display HER2 protein? Um, and the grade of the cancer is also taken into account, um, which is the degree of abnormality that we see under the microscope in the, in the cells. Early stage breast cancers have a 99 to 100% survival with the treatments that we have available. The treatment strategies for breast cancer uh, is multimodality. Surgery is part of treatment that 
is a local part of treatment that treats the breast. We're removing the cancer from the breast. We're also staging the cancer to assist with other parts of decision-making when it comes to treatments. Radiation therapy is another local treatment. So it treats the breast or decreases the risk of cancer coming back to the breast as well. Systemic therapy is the chemotherapy, anti-hormonal therapy, immunotherapies that can be utilized with certain types of cancers. In terms of surgery, there are two basic options. We have the option of breast conservation, and we have the option of total mastectomy, which is removal of the whole breast. The decision between breast conservation and total mastectomy is going to depend on the cancer itself, how much of the breast is involved, how large a tumor is, whether or not there's a genetic mutation. If there's a genetic mutation putting a much higher risk for a second breast cancer or a recurrence of breast cancer, then a mastectomy and even an opposite side mastectomy may be considered. If uh, a breast cancer is small, then breast conservation, which is a lumpectomy, can be considered. So in addition to your own personal preferences, the cancer itself plays a part and uh, the, the risk for another breast cancer plays a part in determining what type of surgery is offered and is chosen. Um, when we are removing the whole breast, we can remove the breast and reconstruct the breast, or we can remove the breast and leave a flat scar. Um, that's known as a simple mastectomy when we don't use reconstruction. So we're removing the entire breast, including the skin, the nipple, the areola. Um, lymph nodes are usually removed for sampling. If there's cancer in the lymph nodes, sometimes more lymph nodes may have to be removed. Um, and the scar afterwards is similar to what you see in this cartoon depiction on the bottom right. Um, there's oftentimes a scar across the chest. With a skin sparing mastectomy, we remove the nipple and areola, but the skin over the breast, the rest of the skin is left intact. So we use the skin um, once the breast is removed to help reconstruct the breast. And this can be done by tissue flaps or by uh, implants. With the nipple sparing mastectomy, an incision is made in the breast, but we're not removing any of the skin. We remove the breast tissue underneath the skin and underneath the nipple. This is people who are candidates for nipple sparing mastectomy are women who have a cancer that's not near or involving the nipple are women who have a, a, a nipple that is not uh, severely displaced, um, because in those cases, we may not be able to position the nipple in the proper area. Um, with modified radical mastectomy, this is for women who uh, have inflammatory breast cancers or uh, who need an axillary lymph node dissection, which is removal of this level one and level two lymph nodes under the arm, that's when there's uh, cancer involved in a significant number of lymph nodes. Um, so that's removal of the breast, the skin and nipple over the breast, as well as the lymph nodes. A radical mastectomy used to be used. Um, it's almost never performed anymore uh, because it does not change the outcomes. Um, but that is removal. In addition to what's removed during the modified radical mastectomy, we also remove the chest muscles. Um, but that does not change survival. With lumpectomy, we're removing the cancer from the breast with the normal margin of tissue around the cancer. And we also evaluate the lymph nodes in cases of invasive cancers with uh, breast conservation. Um, we can use a uh, lumpectomy even if a woman needs an axillary dissection or removal of all the lymph nodes. Um, and the, the depictions on the bottom um, are pictures of one of the options for reconstruction. 
So who is a good candidate for reconstruction? So someone who is coping well with their diagnosis, someone who does not have medical conditions that may impair healing. So things like smoking make uh, reconstruction very high risk because of the risk of infection and poor wound healing. Um, diabetes can play a part if, if there's uncontrolled diabetes that will impair healing as well. Um, but you have to go into this with realistic goals. The, the reconstructed breast does not look like the natural breast. Um, it is it is a reconstruction of the natural breast, but it, there's nothing that we can do to reconstruct to look exactly uh, the way the breast looked before surgery. The results are highly variable. Um, you do lose sensation. Um, most women who have a nipple sparing mastectomy do not have any sensation in the nipple. So it's, it's uh, simply for the appearance of the nipple, having the nipple. Um, incision lines are visible, whether from the reconstruction or from the mastectomy itself. And um, there may be additional incisions. If there is a flap, there may be, there's going, going to be a donor site. So you'll have incisions at those additional areas as well. Reconstruction with implants uh, can be done in a staged procedure or in one procedure in some situations. If a person is a good candidate for immediate reconstruction uh, because they have good blood flow to the skin and to the nipple, then a final implant can be placed at the time of your mastectomy. If we're not able to place a final implant at the time of the mastectomy, we can use a uh, tissue, ex what's called a tissue expander to help ready the cavity for the final implant at a later a surgery. This is an implant-based reconstruction. Um, on the cartoon picture, this is an implant that's placed behind the muscle. We can also, in some cases, place the implant in front of the muscle using the skin uh, as the uh, envelope for the, for the reconstruction. And in these pictures, you can see that the incisions are pretty well hidden in these nipple sparing mastectomies. Flap reconstruction is an option if someone is not a candidate for uh, an implant or if they prefer a flap-based reconstruction. Um, this can be done with skin sparing or nipple sparing mastectomies. Um, it can be delayed or done at the time of, of the mastectomy. A latissimus flap is a rotational flap that's used um, when you need a small amount of tissue to reconstruct the breast. Um, this is a, a flap of muscle that's released from the back and rotated around to reconstruct the breast. This is a, a depiction of where that comes from and how it is uh, rotated. Uh, abdominal base flaps are another option. Um, women who have enough tissue in the abdomen are good candidates for abdominal based flaps. Um, if uh, there is a history of, similar with the, the reconstruction with implants, if there is a history of smoking, if there's a history of diabetes or vascular disease that would compromise blood flow and healing, uh, then these uh, types of reconstructions can be more risky because these types of flaps, um, when they're not rotational flaps, are completely disconnected from the blood supply and then reconnected at the chest. So if there is vascular problems or wound healing problems, um, we can see loss of the re reconstruction in those situations. Um, so those are some considerations when the type of reconstruction is being considered. Uh, there are tram flaps, which are rotational flaps. Um, and more commonly used today are deep flaps, which are the flaps that are completely removed and reconnected at the chest. The, the donor site incision for abdominal-based flaps is shown on the bottom here. Uh, it's called the fan and steel incision where it goes across the lower abdomen and around the belly button. 
Oncoplastic reconstruction is an option if a woman is a candidate for breast conservation. Um, it's good for a woman who has larger or very tonic breasts uh, because during this type of uh, reconstruction, as the cancer is removed, the breast tissue uh, is rearranged and lifted and reduced. So um, it's a good option for women who have larger or very um, tonic breasts, which is a hang of the breast. Um, these procedures, including the mastectomies and the oncoplastic reconstruction procedures, uh, we can also offer a contralateral or opposite side matching procedure. So if a woman is getting a mastectomy or removal of one side for a cancer, we can do a, a reduction and lift on the opposite side to match. Or if there's a reduction in lift being performed as part of the cancer operation, we can also reduce and lift the opposite side. Uh, reduction in lift is also used, and this is pictures of some of the scars that you can see after this type of procedure. This type of procedure can also be used as a first stage for nipple sparing mastectomy. If a woman has very large and breasts or nipples that hang very low, we can lift the nipples first in a staged, recon, uh, a staged mastectomy. So we do the reduction first and then go back to do a nipple sparing mastectomy with reconstruction. This is good, a good option for women who are not dealing with an, an active cancer, either a prior cancer or have a genetic mutation and are undergoing risk reducing mastectomy to prevent or reduce the risk of breast cancer. So I, I will turn over uh, the talk to Dr. Kopowitz at this point. Okay, can everyone hear me and see me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about radiation treatments for breast cancer. I will try to be brief because I know um, we're, you know, moving uh, relatively long. So I'll try to go through quickly. But basically with radiation, there are a lot of different ways that we can do radiation treatments. I'm going to focus on external beam radiation, which is the type of radiation that we do here in uh, St. Luke's Cornwall. And in fact, I am presenting from our facility in Cornwall which is just down the road from the hospital in Newburgh. Um, and so we, we typically do external beam radiation. Next slide. So how does radiation work? So basically the way that radiation works is we're using beams of very intense energy to kill cancer cells. And the type of radiation that we use when we give radiation for treatment is a type of radiation called ionizing radiation. And basically the way that ionizing radiation works is it causes a large amount of energy to be released, which essentially causes an electron to be pulled out of an atom. And what those electrons do is that they go in to the body and they cause DNA damage. And that DNA damage will subsequently treat the cancer and kill the cancer. And the way that we produce the type of radiation that we use is in a large machine called a linear accelerator. Um, specifically the type of linear accelerator that we have here is something called tomotherapy. And as we move along, uh, we have a couple of pictures of our machine. Next slide, please. So I'm going to walk you through the process of what happens when you come for radiation treatments. And there are a whole bunch of steps as we go through the radiation treatments. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So after the patient is sent to me, we do a consultation where basically we, we talk, uh, I explain to them the process of radiation, I explain to them what my treatment course is. And if the patient agrees to go ahead with the radiation, the first step is something called the simulation. And basically the simulation is the dress rehearsal for the treatment. So it's, it's essentially what the, we do for a planning session for the radiation treatment. And the way that it works is we bring the patient to our department and we bring them to our CAT scan machine. And this is actually a picture up here on the top right of the actual CAT scan machine that we use when we do the simulation in our department. And for breast cancer treatments, we can actually treat patients in one of two positions. Either we treat people lying on their back or we treat them lying in their belly. Mm. And actually lying on the belly is very similar 
um, to the MRI. You saw a picture before Dr. Perrin showed of a patient who goes for breast MRI. It's actually a very similar position to that. So ideally, we like to treat people lying on their belly. And the reason for that is that it reduces toxicity. We can reduce some of the skin reaction. We can reduce some of the radiation that's going to critical structures like the heart and the lungs. Um, but we can't always do that. So for example, if we are treating lymph nodes in patients who have more advanced cancers, then typically we need to treat them lying on their back. And you can see here, this is a picture of a patient in the middle who is being simulated lying on her back. And then this pink board on the bottom is an actual picture of our prone breast board. So this is the board that we use when we treat patients who are getting treated on their belly. Next slide. <clears throat> So once the patient has been simulated, uh, we after the simulation, we will give them little tiny tattoo dots, which we put on their body, and we use those to set them up for treatments every day. After we do that, uh, we will then send the patient home, and we will work on the plan. And basically, what's involved with planning is between myself, a dosimetrist who actually does the radiation planning, and the physicist who does quality assurance checks to make sure that the plan is safe to deliver. And what happens is we take the images from the CAT scan that we did for the simulation and we import it into our treatment planning computer. And then what happens is I will draw out the area that I wanna treat. So either the breast or the breast and the lymph nodes. And then we will also draw out all the areas that we don't wanna treat. So for example, in a left-sided breast cancer, what's on the left side is the heart. And so we will draw out the heart, uh, we will draw out the lungs, and Sometimes we'll also draw out the esophagus if we're treating the lymph nodes in the neck. And then we'll come up with a plan. And basically the dosimetrist will figure out a way to arrange radiation beams to target what we want to treat, which is the breast or the lymph nodes, and avoid the things that we don't want to treat, for example, the lungs and the heart. And you can see here, this is a picture of two different plans. The one on the left is a picture of just a breast being treated. This is a patient in the prone position on their belly. And the picture on the right is a patient who is being treated to the breast and the lymph nodes um, supine uh, on their back. And what we're looking at is basically what I see when I evaluate a radiation plan. So I'm looking to see what the radiation plan uh, looks like, how much dose is going to the breast, how much dose is going to those critical structures. Um, and we get all kinds of numbers that we look at. We also have a graph that's that thing on the right with the white, with the lines, um, basically tells me how much radiation dose is going to all those structures. And I evaluate that and I look to see, you know, whether I find it acceptable. If I do, I approve the plan. And then we go on to the next step, which is the treatment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so once I approve the plan, the patient will come for treatment. And as I was saying before, we have something called a tomotherapy here. And this is actually a picture of our actual tomotherapy machine. This is what we use when we do the treatments. And the patients come for treatment. And when they come for treatment, we will set them up in that exact same position, whether it's their back, whether it's their belly, the same position they were in for planning. And the first step before we do the treatment is we will take a picture. And the purpose of that picture is to make sure that the patient is set up appropriately for treatment. So if you remember before I said we give the patients tattoos and we use those tattoos to position them appropriately on the, on the radiation table. And then once they're in that position, we'll take an image. And you can see on the bottom left, it's a picture of the images that we get. So the pink is the picture that we get every day when the patient comes for their treatment. The gray is the picture from their simulation. And basically we overlay them one on top of the other and we look to see if they're lined up appropriately. If they're lined up appropriately, we'll go ahead and get the treatment. If they're not, we'll make some adjustments. Sometimes we'll move their position a little bit to the side. Uh, sometimes we can rotate them a little bit. And once everything looks good, they'll get their treatment. So typically with breast cancer treatments, uh, there, are, there are a few different ways that we can do the treatment, ranging from shorter to longer. So this is actually a little bit of an older slide. It says 16 to 33 treatments. Um, that, that may have actually changed a little bit more recently. So, you know, on average, we'll, we'll do somewhere 15, 16 treatments. Sometimes if we're treating the lymph nodes or if a patient has had a mastectomy, we'll do somewhere around 30 treatments. Um, and in fact, there are actually shorter regimens that we can do nowadays uh, where some people are even getting five treatments. Um, so that's, that's sort of a newer way to do treatment. Not everybody qualifies for that, but that's something that, that can sometimes be done. Um, and then 
once the patient has their treatment, once a week, I will see the patient to see how they're doing. You know, the, the main side effect that we tend to see during radiation is the effect on the skin. Skin can get a little bit irritated, uh, a little bit red, a little bit dry. And so I'll check the skin, make sure it looks okay. If not, we'll, we'll manage the side effects um, and, and we will see the patient once a week to, to take a look at those side effects. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so these are just some of the frequently asked questions that people will, will often ask me um, as a part of consultation or as we're going through the treatments. Um, and just to answer you know, a couple of them, um, but how do I decide the number of treatments? So it's, it's relatively standardized actually. Um, there's different regimens. And like I said, some people will qualify for some, some people will not qualify for all. Um, some people will actually qualify to not have radiation treatments at all. And these, these numbers, these regimens were decided upon in various clinical trials. Um, so they're fairly standardized. Um, will I lose my hair or will I be sick? Not from radiation. Will I be radioactive? No. Um, are there any dietary restrictions or vitamins? And the truth is no dietary restrictions, but we do typically recommend uh, not taking any vitamins that are very high in antioxidants. Next slide, please. And that's it for the radiation part of things. So patients, who are the patients that we would consider them for chemotherapy? Uh, and uh, what type of chemotherapy regimens do we have for these patients? So patients who have a very large tumor, who have multiple lymph node positive tumor, uh, these patients are often considered for preoperative chemotherapy. Patients who have triple negative breast cancer, even if they are node negative, if their lesion is larger, uh, then two centimeter, we would consider preoperative chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy is given either in a preoperative fashion or in a postoperative fashion. So preoperative uh, chemotherapy gives us benefit of evaluating this patient's response to the treatment as we give them chemotherapy uh, to see whether the tumor mass is actually decreasing, uh, are the lymph nodes actually decreasing in size. Sometimes lymph nodes are not palpable, but they are biopsy proven positive lymph nodes. And so we may not be able to evaluate them clinically, but we can certainly follow them with sonograms as needed or at least imaging after the chemotherapy is completed so that when they go for surgical management, we would know what was the clinical response. And then when we do the surgery, what's the pathologic response? So the benefit of preoperative chemotherapy is to see whether the tumor was actually sensitive to chemotherapy and also helps the surgical outcome in management of the patient as well. So patients who have triple negative tumors, they are given chemotherapy regardless whether you give them preoperatively or postoperatively if the tumor is more than five millimeter in size. Patients who have HER2 positive cancer, they are also given uh, HER2 targeted therapy along with chemotherapy. Sometimes we give dual HER2 targeted therapy Sometimes we give single agent uh, HER2 targeted therapy. These are called Herceptin and Perjata are the two different you know, medications that we utilize to target HER2 receptor. So any patient whose cancer is diagnosed, we look at the size of the tumor, the nodal status of the tumor, the estrogen and progesterone receptor status of the tumor, HER2 status of the tumor, and decide whether they should undergo chemotherapy or not. Sometimes when the tumors are small and uh, they are ER positive and HER2 negative and lymph node negative, then we evaluate that should this patient receive chemotherapy or not. And in those cases, if we have question, or uh, we do it, or sometimes if the tumor is more than certain size, we prefer to know uh, so that we do not give them unnecessary chemotherapy. In those cases, we do Oncotype DX, which is a molecular genetic testing done on the cancer cells itself to determine the risk of reoccurrence. And actually, a score gets calculated. And based on the calculated score, we determine that should this patient receive chemotherapy, if the score is high, especially higher than 30, then we recommend chemotherapy because then patients are going to be benefited from chemotherapy besides hormonal therapy. Patients whose tumors are ER positive, 
NPR positive, if they're premenopausal, we put them on tamoxifen. If they're postmenopausal, we put them on aromatase inhibitors. We often put them on these treatments after the surgery and after the radiation. However, sometimes if surgery is delayed for certain reason uh, and we want to treat the patient, we sometimes put them on these pills beforehand. Uh, in, so some of the drugs that you may have heard is AC followed by T, meaning adriamycin, cytoxan followed by taxol. Sometimes we use taxotere and, and cytoxan. In sometimes older patient or patients whose uh, risk category is considered lower or who are not a candidate for taxane and or adriamycin, we choose CMF chemotherapy for them. Uh, addition of carboplatin, uh, in some of the cancers such as triple negative cancer we utilize, now um, uh, we utilize immunotherapy even for triple negative uh, cancers when we are giving them preoperative chemotherapy. Uh, sometimes if these patients are found to have residual cancer after the chemotherapies, after the surgery is done uh, and they have already received preoperative chemotherapy, we offer them Zolota in case of ER negative cancer. Sometimes we offer Verzanio along with uh, hormonal therapy uh, in uh, ER positive cancer. And in patients who are HER2 positive cancer, sometimes we offer Cadzilla and other oral HER2 targeted therapy in order to improve their overall disease free survival, recurrence rate and improve the overall survival. Certainly all patients who are undergoing chemotherapy that can potentially affect the heart, we do the preoperative electro uh, echocardiogram and uh, patients who are receiving chemotherapy often require porta cath placement. Uh, so there is a whole host of discussion that goes along with all with preparation of chemotherapy in terms of laboratory test, echocardiogram, porta cath placement, understanding the side effects of chemotherapy, the schedule, the dosages, the uh, pros and cons, the side effects. Uh, uh, so each patient, you have to tailor it to that patient's pathology report and clinical staging as well as pathologic staging, depending upon when you are utilizing chemotherapy, be it preoperatively or postoperatively. The hormone receptor status will determine that are we going to utilize hormonal therapy, such as tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors, and usual duration for these treatments with aromatase inhibitors is considered 10 years. In patients who are placed on tamoxifen because they are premenopausal, if they become postmenopausal, then we add aromatase inhibitors after they complete the course of tamoxifen and are confirmed in menopause. Sometimes these patients are given uh, injections to suppress the pituitary ovarian axis so that they are rendered uh, postmenopausal, although they are younger and are not in menopause. And in those patients, if they are rendered into menopause by giving Lupron injections, then we add uh, aromatase inhibitors uh, such as arimidex or anastrozole uh, or letrozole rather than giving them tamoxifen as we feel that uh, aromatase inhibitors are somewhat superior to tamoxifen. And so if we can offer that, we discuss that with patient and discuss the pros and cons and then uh, offer the hormonal therapy. The follow-ups of these patients, uh, once again, I believe Dr. Perens have addressed this. So follow-up of these patients who are diagnosed to have breast cancer, the mammograms and sonogram of the treated breast would be every six months for first one to two years, and the other breast, which is normal breast, uh, based on the previous imaging and reports annually or sometimes every six months. Also based on risk get category, they are also evaluated with MAMO and SONO and or MRI. Clinical breast exam is complementary and does not replace. Hence, patients should be seen by their physicians 
on every four to six months basis with breast exam for first two years and then yearly thereafter besides doing the imaging of the breast. And so it is very important for these patients to follow up with their breast surgeon, their medical oncologist and radiation oncologist as there are long-term effect of chemotherapy as well as long-term effect of radiation therapy and there are side effects to hormonal therapy as well. So following during and soon after chemotherapy, these patients are seen every two to four weeks basis. We are checking their blood counts, evaluating them if there is any acute and toxicity from the chemotherapy, be it nausea, vomiting, or mouth sores or diarrhea or leukopenia or low white blood cell count and possibility of infection, uh, as well as chemotherapy-related neuropathy uh, and or cardiomyopathy, meaning effect on the heart. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, they are monitored on every three to six months basis for a first year and then every six to 12 months thereafter for five years and following that, they are followed every year. Mammogram I already discussed and the survivorship, Dr. Kaplowitz. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about survivorship, which um, I think is actually really important because, you know, more and more women are surviving from breast cancer. And so it's important to talk about because, you know, it's important to know that there may be long-term effects of various treatments. And so it's important to be aware of this. Um, it's also important for other physicians who are taking care of these women to know about the treatments that they've had. And that's kind of part of, of you know, what we talk about when we talk about survivorship. So overall, almost 90% of women will live five years, five years or more after their diagnosis. And survival has been steadily increasing over the past 20 years. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the way that we define survivorship is the process of living with, through, and beyond cancer. So with this definition, cancer survivorship begins at the time of diagnosis, and it includes people who continue to have treatment to reduce the risk of recurrence or to manage chronic metastatic disease. So people who are living with cancer. Next slide, please. So there's different phases of survivorship. So the acute phase is the time when you're diagnosed, but you have not yet actually been getting any treatment. Then you're actively getting treatment. And then the extended follow-up phase is the part where you're getting back to quote unquote normal. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of people who are involved in survivorship. So obviously the patient and their family, but like I said, there is a whole team of patient, uh, a whole team of people uh, who are surrounding the patient who are going to be involved in survivorship, and that's all of their oncologic doctors, the surgeon, the surgeons, the medical and radiation oncologists. But their primary care physicians need to be involved because, again, they need to know what type of treatments and what, what's been done with the patient, uh, various nurses. And then there's also navigation um, and psychosocial support personnel who are involved. And then obviously all of the ancillary clinicians, the radiation therapists, the pharmacists, the research staff, palliative care, genetics, uh, various therapists who are all involved. Next slide, please. So survivorship is important because you really need to take into account that these patients are going to live for a long time. And so they need to be surveilled for the rest of their life because we want to make sure that we're preventing any new cancers or any recurrent cancers. We also need to talk about any late effects that may happen as a result of treatment. So um, obviously, as, as part of this, we're going to do surveillance with a mammography, possibly MRIs. Uh, to ensure that the cancers do not come back and to make sure they don't develop secondary cancers. We want to assess any late psychosocial effects or any effects of the various treatments that they've received. Um, and if we find that any of these things have happened, obviously we need to intervene. So whether patients are having distress, whether they're having financial and social issues, we want to address it um, and deal with it when we find out that they're going on. And so again, a lot of times this is going to be falling onto the primary physician because they're the ones who years down the line are going to be following up with these patients and going to be seeing them on a regular basis. And so they may be the ones who need to coordinate um, all of these needs. Next slide, please. So the part of the survivorship um, that's really important is the survivorship care plan. And, and the reason that this is important is because the primary physician often does not know what types of treatment were involved. And so what the survivorship care plan, one of the main components is the treatment summary. And this will detail all of the 
parts of the patient's diagnosis. So it will say what type of cancer they had, um, what treatments were done, what tests were done. And so this is going to be really good information for the primary care physician to have, because otherwise they may not know this information. It's also something that we will give to the patient and they take with them, they carry for the rest of their life. Because for example, if a patient is treated in New York, um, they retire, they move to Florida, they will take this piece of paper with them. They can show it to their new doctors in Florida. And so they're going to be able to give it to these doctors who will now know exactly what happened. So um, when a patient finishes, we, when they finish their radiation, either the physician or the oncology navigator is going to review the survivorship care plan with them. Um, the other part of it, by the way, is that it will have any ongoing treatment. So if there's any hormone treatments, uh, Dr. Patel was talking about hormone treatments that patients may be receiving for many years after they've completed their surgery, their radiation, you know, that information is going to be in the survivorship care plan as well. Uh, next slide, please. That's it. 